Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Everton Motor Racing Podcast. You're here with your host, Declan, as always, and I've got Jacob on my side. Hello, Jacob. Hello. Uh, so, 64, Jacob. Riders number 64, please. Right, well, should I be honest uh, yes. about um, what's happened, or should I just pretend I'm fucking smart? Yeah, be honest. <laughs> yeah, we... Uh... We've already been through this once, but the recording yeah. crashed. So we're doing it again. I, but... I didn't record, and then Jacob's recording didn't record full stop. So Yeah, but it does mean that I can now say that it's 64 numbers and look really smart. There's David Munoz, one of them, which I did we... struggle to get at the start because I'm very tired. And the other, obviously, Federico Caracasula. That you didn't have. Um, I did not. So yeah, before... The magic of editing will appear and Kyle Wyman will suddenly appear back with audio It's speaking to us. Um, yeah, we've got Kyle Wyman on the podcast. It's been a long time coming, as he did say originally, but it's not actually recorded. Um, and yeah, it is a good episode so far. We're like 18 minutes through. He's had to go move his car. So <laughs> um, we're having a little break whilst we sort our own audio out. So yeah, it's fun, but we'll work it out. Um, yeah. Enjoy Cheers. the podcast. I have changed the icebreaker question because we used to ask one question and to be honest, I got a bit bored of it. So the new icebreaker question for you, Kyle, is if you could ride any bike at any track in the world, it doesn't have to be a bike you've ridden, what bike would it be and why? Yeah. Um, man, I guess it would be... It would probably be like a you know, in, in or like a mid two thousands GP bike, you know, at, uh, at Laguna or, you know, something, something like that. Like if I could ride Nikki's bike at Laguna oh. in its configuration that he wanted just to understand, you know, something like that would probably be, be pretty, pretty awesome. Or just, uh, something that maybe could happen one day is, you know, getting on a, a factory Harley flat track bike at a perfectly prepped, you know, cushion half mile. Nice. Just letting her eat. Yeah, that'd be ace. Yeah, a lot of the um yeah, very two very good answers. <laughs> yeah, it seems there's a lot of you like obviously American over here the flat track isn't as big. We've got a kind of speedway over here that's massive, but flat tracking's not as big. Over there it seems massive. Obviously you've got a JD Beach, um Rispoli as well, who does it. Those off top of my head, Corey Ventura, is it Ventura? I don't know, there's quite a lot. Obviously Kenny Roberts did it back in the day. It's quite, it's a lot bigger than it is over here. Yes, um, it's interesting. But um, I always ask, basically, the start of every guest, I always want to kind of find out, go right back to the start and ask how exactly it is you got into racing exactly. Like, what made you start and pick up a motorbike for the first time and go, yeah, this is what I want to do? Uh, for me, it was, there was a, uh it was pretty natural, right? Family was in motorcycling. My grandfather started a Harley Davidson dealership in 1962 and, uh, he raced cars back in the fifties, uh, NASCAR actually when it was dirt and before it was what it is today, but he had his NASCAR license in the fifties. So, um, and, and loved motorcycles. So, you know, he would, uh, he would travel to all the grand national dirt track races throughout the, you know, throughout the sixties, seventies, he brought my mom to a lot of the races and, um, you know, she always grew up idolizing flat trackers and got us into riding at a very young age. So, you know, got a PW 50 when I was five years old and started riding around the backyard and started doing flat track amateur races, really young, eight years old racing around New York and, uh, and progressed through the amateur ranks, did the amateur nationals for the first time when I was 12 years old on 85 and, pretty natural progression got pretty pretty fast pretty quick and uh would turn pro that you know the day i turned 16 i could i could you know apply for my pro license in flat track so mm. uh 2006 i was 16 and did three full seasons of ama flat track before i ever even thought of road racing and so that was just all on dirt was it i'm assuming yep all dirt road you know no, no road race experience up to that point. Just all flat tracking. I raced the XR750 Twin nice, as nice. a uh, as a 15 year old actually before I was pro. <laughs> but we had to go to Canada to race the XR750 as a 15 year old because they wouldn't let you ride it until you were 16 in the states. 
I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's one hell of a machine. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it's a bit of a brutal machine. I mean, what was it about? Because obviously you switched to road racing eventually. What was it that kind of enticed you over to the tarmac from the, the flat track? And was there anything specific, or was it just kind of a, again a natural progression over? Yeah, no, it was actually very specific and nothing that was really planned. In the end of 2007, they announced that they would do a, a U.S. Red Bull Rookies Cup. Oh. And okay. so they did one season of Rookies Cup in 2008. So in 2007 is when the tryouts opened up. I was already too old to try out. So I was 17. and uh, But my brother Travis made the oh, team. Did he? So it was something like, yeah, let's go, let's go try it road racing thing let's try that that'd be kind of cool i guess and but he made the team and then it was like wow we should maybe maybe try this so 2008 was my first year road racing and i was just doing amateur club racing at the time but my dirt track background really you know made the learning curve pretty pretty quick for me and uh so i went from amateur to expert halfway through the season which was rare at the time you had to do a full season of amateur to qualify for expert but they bumped me up and uh and then in 2009 they uh they started the age capped 600 class in ama so there was uh you know there was that's when they moved to daytona sport bike as the premier 600 class and made super sport the 16 to 22 year old you know feeder class yeah and uh that was a perfect progression for me in 2009 to go straight to uh the pro racing okay interesting yeah well when you when you first obviously hopped off the flat bright flat track bike onto the obviously the road bike obviously it's completely different but what for you was like obviously because it is tarmac and dirt but what was like did you find the most difficult about adapting over onto a like a road bike the biggest thing was just you know how much you use the front brake and and use the front tire, you know, for, for flat track, it's just all about opening the throttle and turning the bike with the rear. And we never even had front brakes on the bikes, you know, in flat track. So, you know, adjusting to, to that was, was the biggest thing. And, and then the body position, you know, when I first started road racing, I was really pushing the bike down and dragging the pegs on the ground and really had to learn how to get the bike turned and pointed and, and, uh, yeah, crashed a lot. (laughs) <laughs> crashed a lot in the early <laughs> early stages of road racing yeah. smashed up a lot of bikes but you know eventually you figure it out yeah it's all a learning process isn't it i mean there's a lot of like the top riders obviously in history even like nicky hayden for example obviously was on the flat tracks for years before obviously stepping over onto the onto the tarmac but it does seem to be uh over in america anyway a very natural progression for you guys to do the flat track and then obviously onto tarmac whereas here in the uk uh, it's very much you maybe motocross over to tarmac um whereas yeah it's a lot of like you find a lot of youngsters over here will start in motocross or obviously supercross um and then step over whereas obviously over there it looks like it's a lot of flat track into the onto the road bikes which is it's interesting because obviously you all end up at the same point in terms of like where you go racing, but it, it, the way you obviously get into it is obviously very different, um, which I guess builds different characteristics as well. Obviously, even like over in Australia with Casey Stoner as well. Yeah, it's interesting. You've got quite a mix in the US of, of backgrounds. You know, a lot of the guys I race against never raced flat track or did any dirt stuff. They grew up on go kart tracks, on, you know, mini bikes and progressed that way. And then there's for sure a few of the, motocross guys but it's actually really interesting when you look at the field in in moto america right now rookies cup launched a lot of the careers in in america Mm. um you know just you look jake gagne he was a motocrosser who never road raced just tried out for rookies cup changed his career path crazy yeah yeah uh matthew skoltz uh, same thing, motocrosser in South Africa that, you know, tried out for Rookies Cup and made it, you know. Um, you can go down the list. It, it's um, it's pretty cool. You should look up the uh, 2008 U.S. Rookies Cup roster. 
yeah, you'd be uh, interested to see all the names that uh, that kind of jumped in at that point. I did, yeah, I didn't even know there was um, like a, a US only Red Bull Rookies Cup because they had it in the UK with I think Jonathan Ray raced Jonathan Ray raced for it in the um, in the UK and they had a few riders. Yeah, I've just found out the AMA US Rookies Cup. I've got the roster here. Flipping heck. Yeah, there are some names in there. Um, obviously, Corey, Corey Alexander, Jacob Cunningham's there, Gagne, Aiden Gillum. Yeah, there are some. Leonardo Mercado was on there, World Superbike Rider. Yeah, flipping heck. Yeah, Benny Solis as well. Travis Wyman, obviously, your brother. <laughs> Yeah, so it was there was a few there was a couple Canadians, there was uh, a few South American riders, but the uh the series only raced with AMA Superbike. So it was just, it was just a US based series where the tracks were. Oh wow. Yeah, that's uh, I yeah, I didn't even know that existed. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. And obviously some of the names like you said, some of the talent in there. Obviously you got Tati Mercado who's obviously in the World Superbike now. Uh, Hayden Gillen moves obviously in the stock 1000 or your version of the stock 1000 it's quite different over there because you've got the Superbike Cup as well which throws things up a little bit but yeah there's yeah it's America it's interesting obviously it was from 2015 was when it switched from AMA obviously to the to the to Motor America format we know now and relative from from a obviously a guy in the UK in Europe Europe there was really like zero or not much interest over here from what I saw anyway. Obviously, I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. There wasn't much interest in the American racing or anything, whereas now Motor America is huge. Like it's mad. And obviously you've got a top, enough to pull like Daniel Petrucci over there and things like that. It's great to hear that because, you know, we just live in our bubble over here and, you know, it's always, it's always been what we pay attention to, but for yeah. sure the, Really, what there was another transition from 2008 to 2009, which was actually when AMA handed it over to Daytona Motorsports Group, which is DMG, which runs NASCAR. Oh, okay. And DMG had it in the 2009 to 2014 era, where every year we had less rounds, less TV. And by 2014, I think there was a four or five round series and participation was gone tv was gone mm. it was it was on life support and uh wayne rainey and chuck axland and the whole and richard varner that that uh, took it over for moto america they really inherited a world of trouble and they've really turned it around over the past six or seven years oh yeah it's it's come on leaps and bounds and like and there's like more classes added to it every year you see obviously We'll go into a bit, a bit further in a bit, but obviously you've got like the baggers, the hooligans are in there now. And it's it's just, I love it. I love America. Like everything's going on, even like they got the Twins Cup and things like that. It's just fantastic racing. And there's so much, it's just a fun championship. You've got like, obviously Michael Hill goes over and does a lot as well. Um, Obviously with his shows and things like that. And it just looks like a great traveling party from over here now. <laughs> It's a real example, in it? Right. Oh, yeah, it really is. It's really turned. It's the the grids are full. The paddock is full, over full at Laguna. I mean, there, there are people parking oh, outside the paddock <laughs> that are actually racing because there's no room for more entry. So yeah, it's okay. pretty healthy series right now, and with good coverage. And and then Moto America Live Plus, which is available in every country, has made it accessible now for people around the world to watch. So it's great. Yeah, yeah it's like. Exactly. You couldn't find any results about how, like, the America was back in the day and stuff. Like, in the UK, at least. Yeah, you really had to dig it up, for sure. Yeah, it's it's done, like, so well on... It is good racing as well, like... Obviously, even you go back to, like, Laguna and you had Petrucci sending it up the inside of um, Cam <laughs> at the top of the corkscrew. And then even, like, like highlights from every year. Like, you had Baz last year they were making that obscene move around the outside. I think it was Cam again right off the top of my head. <laughs> you know, and then you had SDK absolutely slinging it with uh, Escalante in the uh, 600s last year. And it's just some phenomenal stuff coming out of there. And obviously, you've got, even, like, in the younger classes as well, even... Um, like last year you had, oh, what's his name? Tyler Scott. 
you know, and he was doing really well. And like, and then you've got oh, Kyla Yarkov as well, who's, you know, the female victory. You know, it's it's just so good. And it just seems like anyone can win. You know, even like heroin, 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 no, that's the wrong word. Heroin stepping down to super sport. I mean, down in, in terms of the engine kind of thing, obviously, because he's got, he's got a Moto America title. He's got a stock 1000 title. He just hasn't got the super sport title yet, but he can step back to that super sport class and still be battling that out with a rookie in Tyler Scott again for victories. It's, it's just healthy. I think it's, yeah, it's in a good, it's in a good place. I mean, and for you, yeah, it is. And I think other championships could realistically take a look at Moto America and take some leaves out of their book, to be honest. So back to you. Um, so obviously you've had since, I believe, 2015, your own race team in the Moto America Superbike class. Um, obviously you first won the Yamaha and then you switch over to Ducati and now you don't have a team anymore. So why, why is it that you decided to race for yourself with your own team instead of, for example, being hired by a team to race for them? You don't have to worry about, you know, managing the team, driving the truck, things like that. What was it that made you want to start the KWR team? Well, it was 2012 really where it kind of started and it was with the, the Harley X. 1200 series which was just the most accessible class to go race and you know i was able to get one bike from a sponsor and kind of go racing and it didn't really turn into a team until you know i had another supporter come on that had some more bikes and we started to rent bikes for people to come race in the series and started a business out of it and so you know to the point where by the end of 2013 we were fielding nine riders at, uh, at the Indianapolis race during MotoGP. And, um, that was, that was the business model. That's how I funded my racing was by renting rides to, uh, you know, people who wanted to try out the XR 1200 series or, or just do a, a bucket list track, you know, of the year. And that year it was only XR 1200s that raced alongside MotoGP. So if you wanted to race during that event, you had to be on a Harley. Okay. So that was uh, a big draw. And actually in 2013, we also fielded uh Huffy siren on, uh, on one of my bikes. No way. And, uh, yeah, Patronus, uh, uh, no, Hafiz won that year. Yeah. He, uh, he jumped on it there at Indianapolis and that was uh part of the Patronus program and developing the riders was they wanted to bring uh, Hafiz around to as many tracks as he could see before going to Moto2 the next year. So, uh, you know, they reached out to me to put him on an XR 1200 and yeah, it was kind of, kind of cool to be part of, part of his launching point for his career. Yeah, that's, that is cool. That is, no, that is genuinely pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. So, and from there, you know, just, you know, XRs ended in 2014 when, uh, when Moto America took over. So then I moved to super sport in 2015, had some not great results. I was kind of the sixth to eighth place, uh, rider in super sport. And then, uh, at the end of the year, at the last race, I decided to run, uh, super stock 1000. Hold on. I got security here. You're yeah, going to edit this, fine. right? Yeah. Well, I did. I'll do it. Hold on. How's it going? I need you to move out of my fire lane, please. Okay. All right. Uh, we got a plenty of parking right back up. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Well, I got to pick up and move, guys. Yeah, that's fine. So. <laughs> Do it. I can end this Sorry and then it. call you back in a minute if that's all right. Or Yeah, yeah. That, just give me like five or seven minutes yeah that's fine no worries. <laughs> it's hard to find places to park in california of course imagine, yeah. so all right i'll jump back on in a few yeah no, that's right yeah don't worry don't worry <laughs> all right all right bye oh my god are you allowed to park here now no, we're good now we're i just i got it i'm like 65 feet long right so I uh, just find a Walmart to park at, but I couldn't quite. Oh, picked off. Sorry, uh, I couldn't quite uh, turn in where I was, so I 
was kind of lazy and parked where I could find a spot and got kicked out. So <laughs> all good now. That's all right. <laughs> well, we've had some nightmares with our recordings anyway, so it's it's all good. It's just chaos. It's fine. <laughs> But yeah, so we're already recording, so it's fine. We could just hop straight back into it. Um, I think we were talking about twenty. You were talking. You're in this. You're in the six hundred. Then you moved up to stock one thousand, and then from there, I can't yeah. Remember. So right at the, I was in Super Sport, kind of struggling, and at the last race, I decided to park the six hundred and enter a Super Stock thousand at the time it was called, and um, I put it right on the podium the end of the year no way that point where i was like okay i think uh you know i'm better served on a thousand so i'll make that jump kind of in what i thought was kind of prematurely and um and in 2016 i decided to just go straight to superbike and uh you know i still had kind of a super stock bike but my plan was to to go into superbike and then just try to add parts as i went and try to improve the bike over time and Six years later, I got a full factory level Ducati. So it went crazy you yeah. know, over that time. But um, yeah, six seasons in Superbike, three on the Yamaha, one podium on the Yamaha, three on the Ducati with a couple podiums over those couple of years. And yeah, I basically ran my own program for 10 seasons and, and built it up to uh, be a pretty strong effort in Superbike uh, last year. Yeah, yeah. Here we are now. So. It's um, surely like obviously running your own team like that. It must have been stressful doing like most of the job and driving. Uh, uh, do you drive the rig as well? Yeah, I drove the rig about half the time. You know, towards the end, we had a full eighteen wheeler transporter, and yeah, it just <laughs> it it became a lot. You know, and uh, last year, you know, I was kind of burned out on the. Uh, on the Ducati program, just kind of felt like I had plateaued with the budget I had and what, it, what we could really go do and test and got hurt halfway through last year as well. And I was also racing the bagger for those three rounds at the same time for Harley. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I obviously pushed to do something this year in Superbike with another team and things didn't quite come to fruition. So I decided to just jump in full time with Harley Davidson and, and Harley, you know, left my contract open to do other things if I wanted to. So, you know, that's why you've seen a couple fill-in rides in Superbike this year. Yeah, fair play. I mean, it's it's crazy because you um obviously, like you said, you you did like most of you did most of the work, um, and then you had because you were like the, the only Ducati but on the grid for a long time before then the obviously now what is Warhorse Ducati team stepped in. Um, with Lorenzo Zanetti at first, wasn't it? Who um, beat Cameron Bobier at Indianapolis, I remember. Um, what was that like for you as a Ducati rider, seeing Ducati come in and put another bike on the grid and not give you the support, if that makes sense? Because I know you were getting some support, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, I can definitely clarify, you know, my my point of view on it because it definitely looks different from the outside than what it actually was and Mm. i at the end of 2018 i wanted to try something different from the yamaha and the new v4r came out towards the end of 18 and i wanted to see if i could try to be the guy to put that bike on the grid because ducati hadn't had a presence in american racing in over 10 years so the bike looked obviously pretty strong and i was you know super late to the to the season with that i mean we just started with oem bikes we didn't order you know race bikes from corsa i just had um i actually have the the two first two production v4rs that came off the line were sent to the u.s for me to turn into super bikes and wow i ordered them at a dealership yeah i just i bought them at a dealership you know so i i had this uh yeah, I just had this this intuition that if I if I went and did it, that the support would follow, and it was it was great. I mean, it uh, it gave the Ducati fans a reason to come back out to you know AMA Superbike races and support a guy. And I built it over over time to where just the same 
same way I did with the Yamaha, just added parts as I went. And, um, yeah, we didn't get a lot of support. We got a little bit of help from Ducati North America, but they're a, they're a small company compared to, you know, they're, they're an importer really for the U S and, um, you know, there's not so much that they could do. And, and in 2020, I had a pretty good season going. I, I was able to put the V4R on the podium twice at Road America. And it was later that season that the Warhorse team decided to purchase a, a RS, you know, a full factory bike mm. and put Zanetti on it towards the end of the year. And nothing that, nothing other than the, Factory MotoGP team and the Aruba World Superbike team are truly factory supported. Everything else you see in racing with Ducati is a customer program. So, it you know it does look like there's you know that Ducati's spending money in Moto America, but um, it's it's not necessarily the case. And you know it's uh, it's a customer program, just like Pramac, just like Grassini in in MotoGP and and um, you know, obviously, when there's that kind of money and backing privately to get something going, then Corsa is going to be more visible and involved and, you know, part of it, you know. So that was, um, to me, there was really no hard feelings from Ducati from a support standpoint. The only thing that that was a bummer for me is that they didn't control the narrative of, you know, the fact that it was not a factory team and that it was customer just like I was, you know, I was a customer to Ducati Corsa as well. I just didn't have, you know, the, the money to back it to the, to, to the level of trying to field a factory level program. So, so yeah, it, it uh, it was funny. Cause you know, I had so many fans that were like, you know, can't believe Ducati would do that. You know, they already have a team. I can't believe they're supporting this and that. And that's not really how it was, you know, but, um, it for sure overshadowed my program, you know, undoubtedly. And, yeah. and, uh, last year I threw the kitchen sink at it. I bought as many factory parts as I could. I had basically an RS, you know, except for, you know, I ran SC project exhaust. I ran OZ wheels. Like I d- kind of went my own path with a couple other components that I could get sponsored by. Um, but towards the end of it, you know, it uh, especially with the other team and and how much money they were spending, and Ducati already had a presence there. It was like, yeah, I think I want to try to do something else. So, um, you know, my goal was to get on a different team for this year, and uh, I had a couple deals in the works, but nothing came to fruition. And towards the uh, towards December, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to commit to Harley. Sure. Yeah, yeah, don't blame me. I mean. So obviously with the whole Ducati thing, it's um so obviously you you were with Ducati for a few years. We will go to Harley in a minute, because I do want to talk to you about that quite badly. Um but um yeah, so with the Ducati thing, because obviously it was interesting because obviously for Zanetti to be on the bike, for me it was quite an interesting one because he was like he still is kind of Ducati's European test rider for like the street bikes. You know, you wouldn't see him on a prototype, but you'd see him you know, like he'd be a Balalunga one week for on the K on the in the chair, for example. And then he might stand in on a in a world well, bike round stuff like that. But he was kind of like the Italian man on a Ducati. You know, his Ducati is kind of like Piro is for world superbike. No, for MotoGP, sorry. So to see them put Zanetti on the bike, it did give the impression that it was very much a Ducati factory thing which obviously isn't the case, but it was interesting to see that he could go over there and do as well as he did as well on the Ducati. Um, especially because obviously the against a high level Cambobia, for example, as well, it did raise a few questions, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he did well off the, off the bat at Indianapolis. Um, the system that like the electronic system that's on the world super bikes and the moto America bikes and the moto GP bikes is actually all the same. So like, you know, he could show up there with a, you know, base sectors and maps and stuff. And, you know, he did really well at Indianapolis and Laguna, you know, mm. both tracks that, you know, that, that bike should have a little bit of data and, you know, then, uh, you know, Baz did pretty well. I don't think he set the world on fire. You know, he didn't, uh, he didn't win a race last year, but you know, obviously they're, 
they're going for the highest level talent they can get on the bike. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was able to get a pretty high level package, but you know, if I could do anything differently, I would have somehow found enough budget to have one Ducati Corsa engineer with my team to help Mm. guide the program because you know, without being able to retrace the steps of that machine and where it's been, what the purpose of it is and how it's designed to work, it's really hard to go out on your own and just kind of shoot from the hip and develop it to be, you know, a winning package. So that's kind of, uh, yeah, but I wouldn't do, I wouldn't change anything. No, one, I mean, one thing I did want to ask you um, before we obviously do on et cetera, obviously where you had complete control over the team, everything, parts, budget, how did you choose what the parts were that you wanted? Obviously, I assume some were sponsorship deals, but if you were spending your own money, what was the thought process in choosing the parts like that went on the bike? Well, it was for sure like it, you know, as far as it, I tried to get as close as I could to a current World Superbike chassis. So I got the latest swing arm that I could afford from Corsa. I changed to their their current fuel fuel tank and subframe setup. Actually, last year in 2021, I had the current setup, and uh, the Warhorse team and HSBK were actually on the older 2019 setup. So they were just still carrying over from the previous version. So there were actually some of the parts, just from a chassis standpoint, that that I had that were newer, but. You know, working with my chief mechanic, Dave Hopkinson, just trying to create a package that was sustainable. And, uh, you know, in 2019 and 20, I had my own fuel tanks that we built with a fabricator and yeah, you know, the stuff wasn't that. lasting. And, it, yeah. you know, it was, you know, we really, uh, it, it's because of cost, we just, we, we did the work ourselves that Corsa had already done developing parts for it but that was just the path that i was on you know so just trying to trying to find the lowest hanging fruit in the whole process of you know what's what's going to get us the most bang for the buck as far as performance and and go from there because yeah. like, i've seen owning your own team it's a, it's a definite split in the budget of performance. i'll just go up and buy titanium everything for sure yeah yeah definitely but the fact that you know, the fact that you did achieve podiums and things at the highest level in America on your own team without the Cathy's engineers and all that is seriously impressive. Like to build some, like to go from a Yamaha to the Cathy that's untested in the US, you know, it's a brand new bike. And then to take that to where you did with your own team, driving your own rig, building your own fuel tanks. Because I remember seeing it and I think you're like making them bigger as well because, you know, to add a bit more fuel in there because it didn't have enough fuel. So to get a podium at the highest level in America is like genuinely, seriously impressive. <laughs> and yeah, last year, so, I mean, I, I didn't have a race shop, right? So we actually uh, built that whole super bike in, in my garage at my house <laughs> in Arizona. And, uh, you know, I would, I would fly Dave out and he'd stay in the spare room and wake up in the morning. We'd cook breakfast. I'd go in the office and figure out what we're ordering and getting everything together. And he'd be in the garage sweating his ass off, you know, building the super bike. And that's what we turned up to race with. So yeah, we're, 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 we're pretty proud of, you know, what we were able to accomplish. And, you know, last year was a little bit of a disappointment. I got hurt halfway through the year, like I said, and it kind of, you know, it stopped the progress in a way and, you know, but, uh, it's cool. I sold the bike to a friend of mine actually, who was a sponsor. So the okay. bike's still around and I can still see it. I might get to ride it here and there. So it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not quite a distant memory and, you know, a lot of the stuff's still around. So it's, it's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. I mean, yeah, I remember last year cause you, I think it was your hand or something you damaged or wrist and uh, the elbow. Elbow, that was it, yeah. And you had a load of operations on it, and then you still went out on one races in the back with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember seeing, because you, you, you had like your little thing on the floor and you were trying to see how far you could bend your elbow to see if you could get on the bike and race yeah. again. That was, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, that least. was, it was interesting because uh, that that race at Laguna was the final round for baggers, and I decided, 
you know, physically I could only really race the bagger. So, you know, I had a fill-in rider on the superbike, and I actually did talk to, to Zanetti, uh, yeah. during that time okay. and, uh, was, was looking to put him on the bike, but there was just some challenges was with getting him over from Italy and, and, you know, visas and things. And we, uh, we ended up putting Tony Elias on the bike, which was, Very which cool. was also cool because yeah. I was basically crew chiefing the program as well. So I'm, and then I'm Tony's, Tony's crew chief on my own team, you know, got a world champion riding for, uh, for KWR and, um, yeah, it was a pretty cool experience and, and a good weekend. Cause then, you know, I was able to win the bagger race and, and wrap up the championship for, for them just, just a couple of weeks after I had surgery. So it was, it was just nuts. Just yeah. a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely bonkers. Like, yeah, everything about that weekend. I remember it like, like and yeah, it's just crazy weekend for you guys. I mean, like again, to have like Tony Elias on the bike as well. You know, like you said, world champion, obviously 2017 Moto America champion as well. I'm sure he, he probably gave you a lot of very valuable information as well as a rider and obviously with his experience as well. Was there was there anything that he kind of gave you that you didn't even think about before, maybe, or you know? Uh, we, we definitely tried some things, but I would say he, uh, he more so he validated the things that I was struggling with. You know, I, I was, I would be more than happy to see him jump on it and put the thing on the podium or, mm. or go run at the front. But, you know, he finished about where I was finishing on the thing. And, you know, he, he faced all of the same challenges with the chassis and electronics that I was struggling with as well. So, you know, it's, it was uh it was a cool it, it it was pretty rewarding having him you know say yes to coming and riding for my team because it showed that you know there's a certain you know that that, that I'm respected as a team owner I guess and that we've yeah. grown it to a point where you know it's attractive for a rider to want to come and work with us so and then um you know it opened the door for him to go and then ride the attack yamaha after that and uh and put that thing on the podium so yeah. it was uh it was a good experience all around and i got back on the superbike of course for the last few rounds and kind of struggled a little bit i almost got another podium at barber at the last race i was yeah. in third in the rain and and tossed the thing down the road and <laughs> that would have been a really really good result and a good way to end end the uh the run on Ducati, uh, especially because it, I crashed out a third and gave it to Loris Baz. So oh. there was, uh, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking to, uh, finish that way, but you know, it was, um, yeah, like I said, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, you yeah. said you were trying to get Sanetti. Um, see, so really he's the Ducati test rider, etc. Do you think he could have provided you some information that perhaps you would? Definitely. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, he was going to come over and he was going to basically bring a setup sheet and say, put this in it and it'll be something I'm familiar with and we'll go ride it, you know, and it was at Laguna where he did race the previous year on the other bike. So it would have been good. But I think, uh, you know, just overall for the team, uh, Tony was the right choice, you know, and and uh, all of his experience riding different bikes, you know, and and uh, like I said, it was rewarding to have him on it and uh and and kind of keep feeding uh, our paddock over here. Tony, we consider, you know, part of the family over here at this point. He's a, he's a great guy. He's brilliant. He is brilliant. Yeah. I feel like Tony a lot. He, um, yeah, he's just a funny guy, isn't he? And, and like the fact that he can like, like you mentioned, obviously he hopped on the Yamaha later on in the year and was very competitive on it, which firstly shows maybe one, how good the Yamaha is, two, how good Tony still really is, the fact that he can get a podium on the Yamaha, and the fact that, I don't know, maybe, and obviously the, the level he performed at, obviously on your bike as well, was similar to you, that there's a lot of talent <laughs> in America for one, but also that, I don't know, that he's never really lost it, and that, I don't know, maybe if you got that attack Yamaha, you'd be winning some races as well, maybe. <laughs> There was definitely a, a, you know, we talked about it a little bit. He's like, man, you know, cause he got on it at Pittsburgh after he raced my bike. And I said, you know, and he went out and was like P2 in the first session, you know, first time riding the bike. And I was like, how is it? He's like, man. It's, yeah. It's like, that's uh, 
I, I'm so happy for him, but yeah, you know, obviously it's like, man, if only, you know, I'd love to jump on that bike. The, the team is uh, pretty incredible. They're operating on a world level over here. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, and seeing what Baz is doing over here, Baz did over here, what Petrucci's doing over here. I think it speaks to the, uh, the level over here and, and uh, how fast these guys are really going in Moto America. Yeah. And the fact that, Obviously, Gagne could, what was it, 17 wins he got last year or something ridiculous like that. Like, um, obscene. And, like, I think he's now, now he's back in his groove again. And I think he's going to, I think he's going to take it to the end. But the fact that it's not easy for him, you know, he can go and win 17 races last year. And then this year, he's obviously he's got Schultz, he's got Petrucci, and he's still beating them. <laughs> he's now leading the championship, which again just shows the fact that Danny Petrucci can go over there look like he's going to win every race. And then as soon as Gagne gets in his little rhythm, it just kind of flips on its head, which again just shows the level. Like, And then, so, so like to get on a Moto America I know podium. There's, there's, uh, Richard Stamboli has expressed interest in doing a World Superbike wild card at the end of this year at Portimao. Yes. Uh, he's, he said it publicly, he'd like to do it. And I think that would be, uh, that'd be really cool. It'd be a challenge for him, of course, but like, if there's any team that could go and kind of jump in and go do something like that with Gagne, yeah, I would be, uh, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised to see him run with the boys over there. I'd be all over that. It's a shame that the, they don't really go to Laguna anymore because Gagne at Laguna, he'd smoke him. It's absolutely smoke him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's you know, it's pretty. You know, you talk about Johnny and Top Rack. It's you know, it's yeah. it's a different level, but uh, yeah. you know. For sure, if they could come back to Laguna and they could they could go do that as a wild card, it'd be uh, be pretty entertaining. Oh yeah, because I remember when uh, Herring did it um, a few years ago. And he did he did double. He did the superbike on the attack, and then he did superbike in Moto America as well on the attack Yamaha as well. It was yeah, nuts. That's just like a suicide mission, man. That's like a lot <laughs> of laps around that place on a superbike. That was that was pretty gutsy of yeah. them to go and do that. Yeah, like fair play to them all. But like it does. You know, you mentioned obviously you mentioned Gagne on, on the Yamaha. See, we've got Tara McKenzie while calling this weekend in the World Superbikes at Donington. That's uh, right. That's right. Which should be good. I mean, I think Taran's he's still a little bit injured. Obviously, he snapped his leg twice this year, but I think I don't know. I'd like to maybe see even Jake do a a British Superbike ride. I think that'd be quite interesting. Yeah, it's, you know, we can we could talk about that for a while because it's yeah. I unfortunately I do think it's going to be tough tougher for Taryn to go do it than it would be for Gagne just because of the difference in electronics and the Mm. style, you know, you have to adapt to, you know, ride based on just, just torque settings only in BSB. Whereas, you know, we have the full world Superbike kits that we run in Moto America where, you know, Jake would be able to go and and pick up the throttle the same way he does here, you know? Mm. And I think that that's going to make it a little bit tougher for, for uh, Taron to, to go and do it, but you know, obviously, it's you know, home round. Yeah, he's. I'm sure he's he's been riding on the system at least to get used to it. But it's it's uh it's not quite apples to apples the way it could be. You know, at least the tires are the same for him. Mm-hmm. You know, where we have Dunlops here, but I think uh, I think it might be a little bit easier to go. You know, same system than to switch uh, than same tires. Yeah, and obviously Jake's ridden the Pirellis anyway when he did the Raniere's for the Honda as well. So, yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, back to you. Um, so obviously you mentioned a few times, obviously you would got to work with Harley Davidson back, as you said, obviously in the XR uh, 1200 series. But obviously you're now a Harley Davidson factory rider. And I know you've said quite a few times actually that, you know, it's been like your dream since you were a child to work with Harley, I believe. Um, what what is that like? You know, as a Harley Davidson rider now, what is that like for you? You know, to wake up every day and go, you know, I've made it, kind of thing. Yeah, it's cool because you know when I was younger, it was all about being a factory Harley rider and flat track, mm. you know, like like my heroes, you know, Scott Parker, Chris Carr, Jay Springsteen, you know, all those guys growing up, those were my heroes, you know. But to uh, to see the bagger class come come up and then harley field a factory team it is truly meant to be you know everything happens for a reason in my opinion 
with this. I mean, you couldn't write a better story. You know, I, I go road racing and think, yep, that's it. You know, definitely not going to be a Harley factory rider, you know, mm -hmm. cause now I'm on this path of road racing, but it just waltzes right back into my life. And, you know, they picked me right out of the gate to be their, their guy to, to kind of lead the program. And yeah, it's a, it's an amazing feeling. It makes me feel that I'm truly where I'm meant to be. And, uh, you know, whatever happens, happens. Yeah. I mean, is it, I know obviously Travis rides as well. Is, is, is he also on the Harley as well? Is that right? Yeah. He's my teammate on yeah, the factory team. It's also, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's gotta like, be pretty to bring cool. your brother into it as well. Like, yeah, like amazing, amazing story. I mean, obviously the baggers is, it's an interesting one because it's mental to say the least, right? <laughs> You've got these big bikes with these big, obviously like bags on the side. I can't remember what they're called now. Panniers. On my head. That's it. Panniers on the side. And you're hurtling them down the corkscrew at Laguna Seca. And you're, and obviously, like every year they're getting better. I think they're like, there's a massive difference between this and last year. And it's got, it's quite, I don't know, some people love it, some people hate it. I think it's awesome, but for you, like, I don't know, what made you want to ride baggers? <laughs> Aside well, from Harley, it, it is, it is, it truly is a super bike class just based on a totally different package, you know? So, you know, we have the ability to put, you know, full forks, world super bike brake system, you know, custom swing arms, yeah, you name it. It's, it's everything. And I even, you know, the bikes are heavier, obviously, but like the horsepower numbers are getting close to super bike horsepower. And, uh, it's it's getting pretty nuts i mean we uh like you said we went a lot quicker this year at laguna my fastest lap of the weekend was a 29.4 in the race and to put that into perspective my race pace on the suzuki superbike was you know high 26s yeah that's so crazy. Just, you know we're talking a, a few tenths a corner right so it's uh it's insane how fast we're going on these things and uh you know, we're now at every racetrack well within Superbike qualifying cutoff for the grid on the baggers, <laughs> and they just continue to get better and faster. It's bonkers. <laughs> would you it have, is bonkers. Would you have done the baggers had Harley not been a presence? I don't think so. Really? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't. I only because, you know, I've been on this path to Superbike for so long that, you know, the Harley thing was so good that it was like, this is, this is truly a dream scenario. You've got a massive motorcycle company who wants to field a factory team in the sport that you're proficient in. <laughs> there's, there's no better situation, you know? So, I mean, it's a, uh, it's, it's a great feeling to, to fly the flag for them to run the iconic number one logo this year after winning the championship last year and, and truly be a part of the legend of Harley Davidson in a in a big way it's mm -hmm. uh yeah that's that's really what makes it what it is but you know i only say i wouldn't have because i could have never imagined how good these bikes would actually be mm -hmm. and the level i have to ride at to maximize that bike is way higher than i could have imagined you know just going back to the xr 1200 series 80 horsepower 500 pound bike you know we it was a different type of riding, but Superbike has made me a really good bagger racer. It really is. It crosses over very well. Over, yeah. And uh, it's a big motorcycle, but with a lot of horsepower and no trash control. It's like <laughs> kind of brings me back to dirt track at the same time as Superbike. And yeah, you've heard my story. And up to this point, yeah, that's pretty much a perfect scenario. Yeah, it's. And like, it's not just like Harley that are doing it as well. Obviously, there's some big brands. Obviously, you got Indian in there as well. And they're not even like running like an okay or average team. The Indian, yeah, you know, they've got Tyler O'Hara on there. He's pretty good. And then, of course, you got Jeremy McWilliams as well. <laughs> and then, obviously, you had the baggers at the Daytona 200 as well. <laughs> it was just, it's crazy. But it, it's such... It's so unique. It's so, but the thing is, it's so Moto America. Like, you wouldn't see anything like that anywhere else. And that's, it's kind of what makes Moto America so great. 
Hmm. Because they're not scared. They're not to do afraid something. to take risks and you know try something different. And yeah, the first time I saw the Bagger race in 2020, I was like, "Damn, this is different." You know, yeah. this is something to get used to. I don't know if you find me on one of those, but you know, yeah. fast forward, <laughs> not very long, and no. you know, here I am. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was like in terms of the regulations for the baggers. That was one of my big questions I wanted to ask you. Like, what's like? Obviously, you've got the baseline. What is? What are you allowed to do to the baggers within the region? Obviously, everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, there's you know there's limitations. You know, mostly with the engine configurations, trying to balance the rules between the Harley and the Indian, where we have a similar power output. So. You know, Indian's a water-cooled engine, we're air-cooled, so, you know, we're allowed more displacement to try to get on the same terms and keep them cool. So, you know, that's that's where the most of the regulation is focused, is on the balancing between the two bikes. But, you know, we're within a couple mile an hour of top speeds pretty much everywhere. And you've got a really good balance where, Harley, we've got a really good chassis. Indian has a little bit of a little bit of motor on us, so it creates good racing because we have strengths in different areas of the racetracks. Yeah, I mean it's, it's a shame because we we can't watch it in the UK. Like obviously, probably you could watch it on Motor America Live, but we can't watch it on. Um, we watch it on the same programs that we watch like World Superbike on. But obviously, you see the highlights all over social media, and it is just absolutely mad. And like you see them like drifting around corners and things like that. It is it is bonkers. I mean, for you now, obviously, as a because you've kind of given up on well, not given up, that's a terrible word to say, but obviously you've moved on to a different step of your career where you're not kind of running your own race team now. Do you feel a bit a lot calmer now, you know, less stress about the whole thing? Is it it's it's night and day. Yeah. You know, for me now I'm just I'm traveling to the races in an RV. I have no race, race bikes or parts or crap to, to, you know, to keep track of. I've got my street bike, my road glides in the back and uh dirt bike and bicycles. And we're just hitting all the rounds and, and uh, you know, the team's got it handled. So it's, uh, it's great. It's good. I mean, and you make an excellent standing rider if you're asked to, uh, cause you stepped on the, um, the BMW earlier this year and got straight on the podium as well. <laughs> yeah. Which is insane. It was, uh, it's it's crazy. You know, I've fought for so many years just to get podiums on my own team. And then uh, I closed my team down. And, uh, you know, who would have thought that I would miss one round at Coda, get called up to fill in at Atlanta and put it straight on the podium. <laughs> I, I'm just like, yeah, that was, that was a dream day as well because I won the Harley race earlier in the day and then you know, came from 14th on the grid in Superbike to to put that title as BMW on the podium was, uh, yeah. yeah, that was that was pretty special. And, and uh, you know, at least, you know, a reminder that, you know, hey, if I don't have to worry about things so much and I can just ride the bike that, you know, I can I can be better. You know, mm. that's that's what I want to do. So, yeah. And, and, and it means kind of being on that podium, obviously, you meant you beat one of the big three, you know, because obviously you've got guy like in, in World of Bikes, obviously, it's Bautista, it's Top Rack, it's Rayer, and then obviously in, in Most America, it's it's Gagne, it's uh, Schultz, and it's Petrucci with Peterson, obviously, lingering in there as well, because he's, so to beat at least two of those to stand on the podium as well, on a bike that you've not really ridden, you've not done the preseason testing on, you just hopped on, yeah, that, that's, that's something special. <laughs> and mm. I believe it means, I don't know if you're the first, I'm assuming you're the first, to get a podium with three different manufacturers in um, Motor America class as well. I know I know for sure that um, Heron has, I think, three different manufacturers, uh, right. Suzuki, Yamaha, BMW. Yes. Uh, for yes. me, uh, Yamaha, Ducati, BMW. Mm. So... Um, you know, I hopped on the Suzuki this past weekend and we're like, Hey, what if we could be the fourth, you know, but, <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> but it was, it's cool. Cause I, I do have, you know, to my name, at least, you know, I have the first Moto America podium for the V4R mm. and, uh, and also the first Moto America podium for the M1000 RR. And, uh, and then, you know, after that PJ and Hector have gotten podiums since, but, uh, yeah, pretty cool to kind of kind of get get that bike up there for the first first time yeah that is pretty ace and um 
obviously your brother um, Travis as well. He races in. Is it the Stock One Thousand Cup? Is that right? So that's right. Yeah, he does the Superbike Cup as well. I mean, what's it like having your brother as your teammate? It's uh, it's it's great. It's you know, for us, it's a lifelong dream for both of us. Obviously, we grew yeah. up both in the Harley, you know, dealership, and even my younger brother Cody has done a few tests with us on Harleys. And oh yeah, of course, those yeah. days have been really fun because all three of us are riding factory Harleys, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, my mom's just in tears the whole time, you know, thinking about it, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's it's cool for us to, and we we continue to be closer and closer as as this goes on and. We're all having a really good year, man. It's uh, it's it's cool for all three of us to be having success. I think, you know, Laguna. I won the Bagger race. Cody won a Junior Cup race. Travis was on the podium in Baggers and in Stock. And Cody's had Twins Cup podiums. I had a Superbike podium earlier this year. We just there's Wyman's everywhere. That's that's <laughs> kind of what we're uh, what we're wanting to do. Yeah, you should. Why not? Yeah, because I forgot about Cody. Yeah, because he does uh, obviously this, the juniors, and obviously you just mentioned Twins Cup as well. Yeah, it's yeah. Your mom just must absolutely hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of racing. Yeah, like I can't even imagine. Like obviously growing up though, I'm guessing you're quite a competitive household. Then if you've all three of you are racing. Yeah, it's hard to escape it, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I've got some more questions here. Bear with me a second. Well, I got one in the um, interim. Um, so you've ridden pretty much every superbike now. It, what is perfect superbike? Uh, it's a good question. I don't know if I've ridden a perfect one yet. You know, it's, uh, it's a competitive class. You know, for sure, like if... You know, if I had a superbike bucket list, that attack Yamaha is definitely <laughs> still on the list. You know, yeah. I would, you know, you never know when, you know, where things might lead, but you know, I would, I would still, I still have definitely in the back of my mind, you know, if I could get a, you know, a full-time ride in superbike that I can test and, you know, develop and, and not run the team, you know, I, I do know that my, my ceiling is higher than I've, I've been able to reach so far in my career. And I, I still would love to have an opportunity to, to be in Superbike on a good program. Hmm. So do you think that you would be speaking to teams for next year for the season in Superbike? Is that an option? For sure. Talking, talking with everybody. And Harley's been really cool about it because they know what my path has been up to this point and they don't want to hold me back from doing anything. And I didn't get the call to ride that BMW until 7 PM on Thursday evening, okay. you know, at that round. And <laughs> we had already done setup day with Harley and, and I was like, Hey guys, uh, you know, I just got, I just got an offer to jump on a bike and I was, I was pretty nervous to do it because I didn't want to jeopardize the Harley program, but you know, obviously it turned out pretty good. And they know that for me, I feel a little bit underutilized just racing baggers, especially during the race weekends. We don't get a lot of track time and we get, you know, one race on Sunday and it doesn't feel like quite enough for me. Mm. But at the same time, doing both, especially just jumping into another superbike program is kind of a lot. You know, that's that's a little bit too much. So I do think that there is a balance if I could have a, a full time ride in superbike and the bagger and be able to to go back and forth like travis is doing with stock thousand you know mm. you could get into more of a rhythm and and be able to handle both throughout the season um but yeah it's it was it was tough at atlanta it was tough this past weekend at laguna jumping into the m4 suzuki team as well and just hopping on another new bike and didn't quite have the same success we did on the bmw but you know finishing seventh and eighth is probably about where i should finish you know just jumping on a bike so you know we had an exceptional result at atlanta if we hadn't had that then i'd probably be a lot happier with how it went this past weekend yeah that's it the bar the bar becomes higher when you get a podium and things doesn't it <laughs> yeah because obviously you raised alongside richie as well who's i think he got fourth which is it's all right obviously he's a rookie as well um the m4 team as well they seem like a good squad um I'm just trying to think now. So, like, 
because they the Yoshimura, Yoshimura squad it used to be the Yoshimura didn't it and they were separate to that and now they're are they would you say that that's like the the factory Suzuki obviously it's not factory as such but would you say that's like the best Suzuki that's, on the grid that's there, their or? entry for sure I mean that's their primary you know race team in, in the US mm. and the M4 team inherited the bikes and parts and you know, things from the Yoshimura team so They've, they're now in their third season and, you know, they don't have the resources that Yoshimura did. You know, they don't have the ability to retrace the steps of the motorcycle. So, you know, they're still finding their way a little bit and it's, it's tough, man. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, to compete in this class when you're you know, inheriting, a, you know, a little bit of a Rubik's cube that you don't know the answers to and trying to figure out a way to make it work. And, yeah. uh, but Richie's coming along. He's becoming a much more of a super bike rider. He obviously rode great at Laguna. I think, you know, he would say that's his best result so mm. far this year. So I'm not, I'm not actually excited to see how Richie does, you know, the rest of the rounds because he seems to be fine in his way. Yeah, it's mad because he was meant to ride the super, super sport again, wasn't he? Until um, it happened. Somebody left. I think somebody left or somebody moved along. Something happened. And well, I was slated to ride for M4 full time, and then uh, uh, Suzuki actually didn't want me to ride for them if I was on a Harley. Oh, so uh, really? So we, uh, we no we, way. We, we ended that conversation in December, and then they decided they should look within the team and pulled Richie up from Supersport. So okay, there you go. Why? Interesting. <laughs> it's they're so different. What's that about? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's all good. I understand they're you know that the, this is their sole marketing activity in in uh, America and in, in sport bikes. So you know they want to have somebody that's dedicated to you know, their brand, and I don't fault them for it. You know Harley's making an exception, and I think being an exception of the rule to allow me to ride other things. So mm. you know I think uh, it's funny. You know I've, they approved it for me to ride it last weekend. So, you know, they were, they were cool with it now. So that was, that was great. But, uh, yeah, like I said, everything happens for a reason. You know, I, uh, it's, it's funny. I ended up back kind of on that team for, for a one-off, but, um, yeah, I'm pretty happy where I'm at right now being the substitute guy for a couple teams and, and chasing a baggers championship. Yeah. I mean, living a pretty good life. I mean, the M4 Suzuki team, it's, um, Interesting because they have um, like team sponsorships, you know, with like the suit sponsor, for example. If you were to ride for them, would you have had to change or how would that have worked? That's always been part of the conversation with that team because they do team deals for their gear. So yeah, the, the helmets. Rye helmets and the RST yeah. leathers, they do, you know, so I had to, we were a little bit up against it. I had to cover the 6D logos on my helmet when I rode this past weekend and things like that. So yeah. Yeah, those are those are just kind of you know sponsor conflicts that you resolve. But I definitely would never want to give up those uh, those company support to be in custom Alpine Stars and have six D helmets. Who's doing such a good job with the safety side? I you know I'm happy to be with those guys. So yeah, that's it. Because I, I I was going to ask you kind of off air like about the uh, the helmet because I wasn't sure because I did see that you weren't you didn't have a logo on the helmet, but that makes sense because obviously a team are sponsored by RI, so it makes sense. I mean. And obviously you are obviously an Alpha Stars rider, which is the best of the best, really, isn't it? You don't really want to. There's, there's a post for your uh there's a post for your moto gear. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I should do that actually. Yeah, I was thinking about that. <laughs> um yeah, I'm, I'm such a nerd stuff like that. Honestly, it's it's terrible. It's I need I a life, verify. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, because I was I've seen the spreadsheets, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> I need a life, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, because I remember when you did make the switch to Alpine Stars a few years ago and you even said, you know, it's pretty much a dream for you, wasn't it? Dream comes you to be wearing the Alpine Stars. I even, I even saw a comment the other day, somebody asked you to compare the Day and Easy and the Alpine Stars suit and you're like, the Alpine Stars is the best. That's what I've worn. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Alpine Stars. <laughs> How do you find the 6D helmet? Obviously, they're fairly new in the game. It's great. They're a small company. They're U.S. based, but um, they're kind of pioneering the uh, the rotational uh, 
mitigation, you know, yeah. over, over depth as well. So, you know, those isolation dampeners that, that, that suspend the outer layer to the inner layer, you know, individually, they make a difference. I did a wild card in 2017 at Donington and the uh, super stock thousand and had the biggest crash in my life <laughs> and uh, crashed and, and got a concussion, but they took the helmet apart and were able to see that the, uh, the inner and outside, uh, EPS liners, they impacted each other six millimeters out of center. So it took away that much rotation that would have been, you know, transferred to my brain. And, yeah. you know, I believed in what they were doing before then, but when, when I saw the data and, and what came of that big accident and, uh, and how quickly I recovered from it, I was like, yeah, I never want to wear anything else. So, um, mm -hmm. I know that their their next helmet will be FIM approved. They've gotten the homologation for that. Amazing. They're not going to have the budget to throw money at you know a, a MotoGP guy next year and get him in a 6D. It's just probably out of reach. But I really believe in what they're doing, and the product is is great. So yeah, because yeah, they were obviously in a motocross as well, and like that's when I first saw them when I I raced, and they just seemed like a really yeah. solid product. Like I never actually got around to wearing them, but they were always in my consideration kind of thing. So I was just wondering, as someone who actually has worn them for a while, how you how you found them? Yeah, I've been. They're definitely dirt dirt guys over there. So them going into the street helmet, you know, market is a is a big step for them, and I've been able to help them develop shield mechanisms and tear offs and rain setups that they never have to really deal with. You know, that's up to the goggle guys in motocross. Mm. You know, yeah. so for for them, it was a challenge, but you know we've got a great uh, a great setup now with it. Cool. Yeah, because I'm all right in saying because obviously I'm not too familiar with sixty helmets. I know because a few guys in BSB had them a few years ago. Danny Buck and um, Danny Ken obviously Cam Bobby had them last year, but they couldn't provide support for Moto Two this year, um, which is understandable given how the level of support you would need. Um, but I'm, I'm all right saying, obviously, for people who aren't too familiar as well, the inside of the helmet kind of, it moves, doesn't it? Is that right? It's like an anti-concussion thing where, because obviously most helmets, they have, you've got the protective layer and then you've got the shell and they kind of stay together. Whereas this one, it kind of moves to stop concussion. Yeah, it says, it's like they call it suspension for your head. You yeah. know, if you can, you know, when you, especially when you hit the ground at an angle, you know, your, your brain twists and turns inside your head. So if you can have the helmet absorb some of that rotational force, you know, the shearing force is, is a big part of the concussions, not just the, the impact. So they've been able to really, really take that force and, and absorb a lot of it and take it off the brain. And, and, uh, I think that it's, it's moving to, you know, make other helmet manufacturers revisit their technology and find new ways and they're really paving the way in that in that regard it's something that sounds so simple but i know it isn't but it makes you think why didn't they do that 20 years ago yeah especially with yeah. like yeah because like there's such a massive discussion at the moment especially motor gp with all the concussion with a lot of riders getting concussions pretty much every week, every race these days, there's, there's somebody out with concussion or, you know, they're banged to red and you've got people moaning on Twitter about it and things like that. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but it is like, obviously a serious issue. So, you know, this technology can only be good. And if we've got an FIM homologated helmet, then, you know, hopefully it will push other brands to kind of, yeah, I was able to join in on a little bit of a conversation on Twitter with a couple of the MotoGP journalists about helmets because one of them discovered the 6D at one of the shows over there. I saw that thread, yeah. Kind of, yeah, it, it exposed some people to to the helmet. And uh, like I said, with Cam, Cam Bobier was in it in 2020, but couldn't wear it in Moto2 because of because 6D didn't have the FIM homologation. Mm. Was Not it, because yeah. they couldn't pass the homologation, but because yeah. they didn't have the money to purchase the homologation, you know? So um, they're getting that done for next season. And who knows, maybe they can get Cam back in a 6D for next year. It'd be great to see at least one of them in the world championship if if we can possibly get it there. So 
Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, because it's an extensive progress here for my FIM homologation because I do, I think they test like, I think it's five helmets of each size. It's it's absolutely bonkers. Yeah. The, and if they obviously haven't got the money to go through the homologation process, they haven't got the money to yeah. run the work. Yeah, you're talking about 25 helmets, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, and they're actually, they're, they're only homologating certain sizes because there's not a whole lot of GP guys with 2XL sized... <laughs> You know, heads so yeah. you know to get it on the grid they're kind of you know trying to find a way to to do it on a budget but um like i said their product is is gold standard you know it's just uh you know the challenges of a smaller company trying to break into the market yeah that's it i think obviously it will time it will come um right i'm gonna look to wrap this up because it's getting quite late here and i gotta be up very early in the morning for donington park um but to kind of round off, um, obviously you've got two rounds left of this year where you're looking to secure the Baggers Championship again. What's the goal for 2023? I know it's a, a bit early to be talking about 2023, but are you looking at maybe, because obviously Harley Davidson are obviously in the Baggers, are they potentially looking at maybe a Hooligans Championship charge as well or is it just in the baggers and then maybe also super bike ride as well yeah right now the focus is baggers for harley davidson um it is a bit early to to even think about it at yeah. this point we're um me and my brother as teammates are tied for second in the championship one point behind tyler <laughs> and uh with two rounds remaining so Whoa. it's getting real and uh there is not much else to think about at this point other than you know for me winning that title and for harley one of us winning that title so yeah. uh yeah all eyes and focus are on that at the moment for 2023 yeah i'd love to be back on a super bike but it's got to be the right thing you know i know that baggers are going to continue for at least a couple more years so you know i feel I feel pleased to be in a situation where, you know, we know they're going to go racing. So we'll just see where the chips fall for next year. But uh, yeah, we've got Brainerd in a couple of weeks and then our yeah. final round at New Jersey to wrap it all up. And hopefully we can keep that number one plate on my bike. It's, it's crossed, so yeah. good to see a number one on my bike, honestly. I was going to say the same. Yeah. Like, thank you for running the number one. <laughs> not, you don't see it enough anymore. Yeah. No, it's Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and obviously Gagne runs it as well, which is nice to see. But yeah, it's nice. And like, you've got the American flag within your number as well, which looks really cool. Like, big. Is this the American flag? I think it is. It is. So that, that number style was actually designed in 1969 by Willie G. Davidson. Mm. And he, uh, he designed it for Mert Lawwell when he won the Grand National Championship. He ran that number. And nice. uh, that, that, branding and that logo has been an iconic part of harley davidson history and uh for them to uh kind of dust it off and bring it back out to the races and for me to be in the position to run that logo number mm. is an absolute honor yeah. and to uh, and to have willie g and his son bill at the races at road america when <laughs> my brother and i took one too like i said it just Everything comes full circle. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, so I was going to say, it's it, it's a very Harley Davidson number, but I didn't realize the actual history behind it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a trademarked logo. So it's, uh, okay. yeah, it's pretty special to run that as your as your race number. You are living, you the, are dream. living the dream. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you are living the absolute dream. <laughs> Absolutely smashing it. Amazing. Well, um, yeah, I think that's all we've got time for. I'd love to have you on again another time in the future. That'd be really good when maybe me and Jacob are so tired. <laughs> but yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Obviously, it's been a long time coming. Um, and yeah, thank you for obviously coming on. Um, we really do appreciate your time. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Right. So thank you for listening to this podcast. We're back some point soon. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. And we're back next time. Peace.